All right, now in Acts chapter 19, <clears throat> we see here in verse number 1, it says, It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So, Paul and Apollos are kind of split up here. Paul's in Ephesus. And he comes across these guys that, that are disciples. They say they're disciples, right? So he asks them, he says, okay, well, you know, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And, of course, in these days, what, you know, a lot of times when people are getting saved, they were also receiving the power of the Holy Ghost to do all these great miracles and these signs and these wonders that, that God had given to the men, especially at this time when, when the... When, the gospel was really just being spread out and they're going out everywhere and trying to reach all these different people. God in, endowed them with, with this, this extra power to do these healings and these miracles, just kind of giving them the power with their preaching to really just be a sign to people and, and, and show them that this was they, God was with them and they're doing things of God. And, um, you know, he comes across these people and he says, well, have you received the Holy Ghost? And they're like, you haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Ghost. Like, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know anything about a Holy Ghost. So Paul asks him, he says, well, until what then were you baptized? So, well, you know, how were you baptized if you weren't even baptized, you know, in the name of the Holy Ghost? Like, you don't know anything about the Holy Ghost. Then why, you know, why are your disciples? What are you baptized unto? And they said, unto John's baptism. So these men that were in Ephesus, they had, they had heard John preach. They were under the teaching and preaching of John the Baptist, right? And, and we know John the Baptist preached Christ. Sit still. We know that John the Baptist preached Christ. And um, these men were following him and, and they got baptized by John. But then he says, Paul explains in verse 4, he says, Then said Paul, and this is a key verse, and I, we all should remember this verse, because this is going to, this, this explains a lot. Look, let's read verse number 4. It says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, I'm going to park it on this verse for a little while because I've hit on this in many sermons in the past, but I, in this day, in the day that we're living in today, there's this, this doctrine that's going around of you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. And, it, and it's gaining a lot of popularity, and it's, and it's preached in many denominations and, and, and throughout Christianity in general. And this is a wicked doctrine that needs to be attacked, and we need to understand that what the Bible's talking about so that people don't get your head twisted around when they, when they start talking about repentance and they start talking about these things. See, a lot of people out there will take what, what we believe and what I believe, and they'll say, well, you don't believe in repentance. And that's false. That's a lie. I do absolutely believe in repentance. But you also have to understand, what does repentance even mean? And most people will say, oh, you don't, you don't believe in repentance. I do believe in repentance. You're lying if you say, I don't believe in repentance. Of course I believe in repentance. But you have to understand, what they don't understand is what repentance means, especially in the given context of that it's given. See, repentance has different meanings depending on the context when it's used. The word repent itself just means to change or to turn. Turn away from, change. You know, change your mind, whatever. Given the context, what you're talking about is what's going to define how that word is supposed to be used. It's not always talking about sin. For example, God, if you look up repent, just do a word search for the word repent or repentance or repented. Any variation of that word repent. In the Old Testament, God is repenting more than anybody. By far, God repents. God repents. So if it always had to do with sin, you got a problem with your definition because God doesn't sin. When God repents, it has nothing to do with sin. God's changing his mind. He's changing a course of action. Maybe he decides not to bring judgment upon a people because of their actions, because of their works, because of the things that they've done. He changes his mind. He repents. Right? Now we see here, people always say, oh, well, John the Baptist and Jesus taught repentance. They said you have to repent to be saved. Okay, I won't even argue with that, but what does it mean? What does the repentance mean when they're talking about salvation? Matthew chapter 3, keep your finger in Acts chapter 19 because here he's talking about John. He's talking about John the Baptist and he talks about the baptism of repentance that John was preaching. 
Let's turn to Matthew chapter 3 and let's see what they're talking about because these people who teach you have to repent of your sins and be saved, they don't want to turn to Acts 19. They're not going to turn there. They're going to turn to places like Matthew 3 where there's not very much detail given. Matthew chapter 3, look at verse number 1. Because this is where we start seeing John the Baptist's ministry. Matthew 3 verse 1 says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, see? John's saying you got to repent. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, We need more repentance preaching. And that's what they did. He went out and preached repentance. Okay. In that context, repent from what? What do you have to change? What are you repenting? There's not that much given there. But see, they'll take verses like this and then they'll just go off and just say, oh, well, you, of course it's talking about your sins. You have, to, you have to live a good life. You have to give up you know, all of your sins and be willing to turn from them and to, and to trust the Savior. Look at verse number 11 in Matthew chapter 3. Verse 11 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is the exact same phraseology in Acts 19, 4, where it says that John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Matthew 3, 11, I need baptize you with the water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then in, in uh, Mark 1, 15, it says, you have to turn there, it says, in saying the time is fulfilled, this was Jesus Christ speaking, and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye, and believe the gospel. So there we get a little bit more information on what's the repentance he's talking about. Repent, believe the gospel. That's what he's talking about. Exactly what is divine, defined in Acts 19. Four. Flip back to Acts 19 if you would. Because verse 4 says, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance. Well, what was that? What was John preaching? What was John talking about when he was baptizing people with the baptism of repentance? What did that even mean? Saying unto the people that they should what? That they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. The repentance that John was preaching is that people needed to believe on Christ. That was the repentance that needed to take place. It wasn't, hey, you're drinking, you need to stop that drinking if you're going to get saved. It wasn't, hey... You know, you're doing this wicked sin. You better quit that and turn from that in order to get saved. That's not what he was preaching. He says, no, you need to believe on Christ. Most of these people, see, they had a false religion. They had a false belief. The Judaism religion, which is still around today, is, is a false religion. People who believe in that religion to save them are not saved and they need to repent. Okay, when people need to repent, it's, it's to changing their belief, changing what they're trusting to be saved. Hey, if you're here today and you're trusting on yourself being such a good person and that's why you're going to heaven because you obey the commandments and you do all these good things for people and you go to church and you pray, you need to repent. But I'm doing all these good things. You need to repent. The same way that John the Baptist preached you need to repent, you need to believe on Christ. Stop trusting in your dead works. Stop trusting in yourself. Stop trusting in the law. Trust on Christ, the Savior of the world who died and paid for your sins. That is the repentance that is taught in the Bible as far as salvation is concerned. Now, in many other places, the Bible talks about repentance where it is talking about giving up your sins. It is talking about living a holy life. But guess what? That in context is not talking about your soul being saved. That is talking about, in some cases, they're talking about physical salvation, right? There are people, if you decide, if I decided tonight to just go out, go to the bar, commit adultery, and start doing all these, just living a wicked lifestyle as a son of God, yes, I'm going to get chastened, but it might even get to the point where God's just going to say, you know what, I'm done with you, and just, and just take my life away. Now, of course, I'm still saved. I've already, I've already received eternal salvation. I have eternal life. But God might just say, I'm done. Now, in order to physically be saved, if you continue in sins and doing this stuff, hey, you need to repent of that. That might result in a physical salvation of just your life being extended and mercy being granted unto you. Um, there's so many places where the Bible talks about repentance. It's, it's very, very critical. Anytime someone wants to come to you and say, no, 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 look at this. Don't just look at that one verse, Okay. Especially if, you, if you're not very familiar with it, read the whole chapter. Read it all in context because you will get to understand 
And especially here, the more you learn the Bible, the more you read it, study it out, because when you see something like Matthew 3.1, where he just says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, well, that's kind of ambiguous if you just had that one verse to go off of. You don't know exactly what he's referring to. What exactly is he talking about? Well, you get a little bit more information in, in verse 11, where he says, I baptize you with water unto repentance, because you could use that then to say, Oh, that looks familiar. I saw that in Acts chapter 19, when Paul explains that John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on Christ. That was the, the repentance that he was talking about. That's what people were being baptized unto. And see, here's the thing. They didn't understand that. They didn't receive the Holy Ghost because they weren't saved. So in, in Acts 19 here, in this story, we see these guys, they weren't saved. And that's why Paul's questioning on them on this. And they didn't quite understand what John the Baptist was preaching. Now, there's nothing that maybe would have tipped anyone off to say they didn't believe. You know, I'm, they were probably honest in their hearts, but they just didn't quite get it. Which there's a lot of people like that today. There's a lot of people that go to church and you can look at them and, you know, they have, you know, more or less good hearts. I know the Bible says there's none good, no, not the one. I'm not talking about that, but just in general, right? People that they'll go to church, they try hard. They, they want to live the way that God's told them to and they think that they're saved. But they're not. Because in some element, they're not trusting just completely in Jesus. Maybe they're trusting their works to some degree. They think that, oh, well, if I were to do something really bad, I'd lose my salvation or something to that effect. If they're not believing right, if their whole heart isn't trusting in Christ, they're not saved. These men, I believe, are very similar. It says they were disciples. You know, I mean, they were, they were following. They were trying to do what's right. But they didn't quite get it. And a lot of times, I find, when I go out soul winning, I talk to people with a lot of people, you could tell there's no reason that they would necessarily reject the gospel. They're not just saying, no, 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 I don't, you know. But you can kind of tell they're not quite comprehending the freeness, the, the, the gift aspect of how salvation is completely free and paid for, and all you have to do is believe. And there's a lot of people out there that are like that. And that's why we use different illustrations. We try saying, you know, use the illustration of being born again, of receiving a free gift, to try to get these this concept across to them so they could understand how simple, how really, how simple it is. But there's so much false doctrine, so many other things out there that, that have gotten into people's heads that it's making it hard for them to, to fully grasp and comprehend that salvation is completely free and you just need to receive it. The same way that if I just held out this book to you and just said, I want you to have this, and you just reach out your hand and take that, as easy it is just to receive that gift it becomes yours. That's what God's doing with salvation. And all you have to do is just, just rely on Him, trust Him, put your faith on Christ, you've received that gift. And oftentimes, people just, they kind of don't quite get it. You know, because they're still stuck in this, in this mindset of, well, if I do good, I'm going to heaven. If I do bad, I'm going to hell. And that's been ingrained in people so hard and so deep for so many years that, that this concept of salvation just being completely free it kind of escapes people sometimes. So, you know, when we go out so long, we're trying to just make it very clear, make it very plain, and go into a lot of depth and a lot of detail to make sure, and we ask questions to, to kind of dig to the heart of what the person believes. A lot of people will say, if you just ask them, well, hey, do you believe in Jesus? Sure, I believe in Jesus. That means they're saved, right? Well, what are they really believing? I mean, it's one thing to say you believe in Jesus, but what do they really believe? And that's why I ask questions like, well, bring up these what ifs. Right? So, okay, you believe in Jesus. Why are you saved? Because I believe in Jesus. Okay, well, what if, I'm not saying you'd do this, but what if you were to go out, I mean, you have free will, right? I mean, you, when you wake up in the morning, you can do what you want. No one's making you do anything. Okay. What if you decided, if you woke up in the morning, you just went out and shot someone at random and you murdered them and killed them? Would you still be saved? Would you still go to heaven? That's where you start to find out what people really believe in their heart. What are they trusting to go to heaven? If they're trusting in the law and their good works, they'll say, well, no, I wouldn't go to heaven because I murdered somebody. I killed. You can't just kill somebody and go to heaven. And that's where, that's where you find out what are they truly believing in their heart. What, what does their heart think? What do they believe? I mean, if you ask me this, that, that question, I'd say I'm going to heaven. 
Now, should I do that? Of course not, of course, but that's not what we're asking. We're just asking whether or not your soul is saved, whether or not Jesus paid for all of your sins, including murder. And that's and this is where you start getting into that. See, people can can look good and act good and, and come to church and and you know if they don't quite comprehend, if you don't grasp the gospel then you're not saved because you can't put your faith on something or believe on something unless you at least understand what it is that you're believing, right? I mean, there's no way, there's no way to put your faith in the gospel if you don't quite get what it is. When you get, when you understand it's a free gift, when you understand it's free, yeah, you could receive it and it's easy. You just, just put your faith on it. But anyway, so here are some men and they, and you know, even John the Baptist wasn't able to see through this that, that they didn't quite get it. And you know what? I'm sure that there are people out there where I've, where I've, talked and given them the gospel and tried to do as much of a thorough job as possible and prayed with them and left thinking that they got saved and they probably and maybe there's some that didn't because we can't see the heart you can do your best and that's all you can do is do your best to explain it you know take the time go through it try to make sure that they get it they understand it and that so that they can receive it and believe but i mean here's some guys that even a mighty preacher like john the baptist didn't then it slipped past him that he baptized. Because I guarantee you, John the Baptist wouldn't just be baptizing people unless he thought they were already saved. Because that's the prerequisite for getting baptized in the first place. Is that you have to be a believer. You have to be saved. Once you do that, that's when you become baptized. That's why we're Baptists. That's one of the reasons why we're Baptists. Because we believe in baptizing people after they get saved. Not when they're an infant. Not when they're a little child. When, they're, when, they're, when they believe. Whatever age it is, but when they put their faith in Christ, after that they get baptized. And um, so here's two men. They got baptized under John's baptism, is what they said. Paul explains to them and says, "Well, wait, John, John, you know, taught the baptism of repentance, saying that you need to believe on Christ." So when they heard that, it says here, let's continue on. It says in verse five, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So then, and that's all they needed to do. They just needed to hear it one more time. They just needed to explain to them, oh, oh, okay, yeah, okay, well, I get it now, and they got saved, and then they get baptized. And that's also why we re-baptize people. If, if there's ever a point in your life where you think, where, where, you, know, you know when you got baptized, I mean, that's, that's easy, that happens usually once in people's lives, maybe more than once. If you don't think that you were saved when you got baptized, then we'll baptize you. We'll baptize you again, because... You need to get baptized after you're saved. So whatever, any other, I mean, you could have been baptized five times. If you weren't saved for any of them, guess what? You just got wet. You took a bath or you got sprinkled or whatever you did. It wasn't really, you didn't really get baptized. Baptism comes after you put your faith in Christ. And, um, you know, back in the early days, they called people Anabaptists because they would baptize people again. And that basically came out of when people were getting saved out of the Catholic Church. You know, they were to say, well, I got baptized as a baby. Well, no, you need to get baptized again because you need to do it the right way. Now that you believe in Christ, you're going to get baptized. And um, I'm not going to get into all that history. Um, but we see here that, that Paul baptizes them again. He says, okay, well, you got baptized before. That's fine. It doesn't matter. We're just going to do it again now because now you're saved. Now you believe. Now you put your faith in Christ. And, um, and we do the exact same thing. And this is one of the reasons why we have an example of this in Scripture. Now, um, in verse number 6, it says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So here they, were, they received the Holy Ghost now, which is what Paul was asking about to begin with. And verse 7 says, And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So here we see, I mean, it's, it's kind of Paul's MO. He goes into the synagogues, right? And he disputes, he persuades, he's trying to teach them. He's going to the Jews. He's saying, look, Jesus is the Christ, right? This is the Messiah. This is who you're waiting for. This is who the prophets prophesied of. And he, and he goes in and, and, he, and he takes a scripture and he just tries to prove it to him. And he's doing this all throughout the book of Acts. I mean, this is, this is what he does, right? And then it says in, uh, in verse 9, But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrant. See, 
when you're disputing with people, when when you're you know, when you're really just bringing the gospel to them and debating and disputing and just and just showing them and trying to prove it to them, there's going to be a point with everybody where there's just kind of a breaking point where you're just going to get to the point where they either just are going to be willing to 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 listen and, and kind of accept what you're saying or they're just going to reject it. I mean, it might be it might, some people it takes longer than others. I mean, he was there for months, right? I mean, he's disputing, he's talking about, it, he's showing the evidence. But after enough time, after enough evidence, and this is a little bit what we were talking about before in service, people can just get hardened. When you hear it over and over and over and over again, and it's getting hammered in your head, and you're just hearing it and hearing it and hearing it, what will happen eventually is people will either accept it or they'll harden themselves to it. And see what happens when they harden themselves to it. It says, um, but when divers were hardened in verse 9 and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. See, now they're going on the offense. Now they're speaking evil of it to the multitude. They get hardened against it first. They hear it. They don't receive it. They hear it over and over and over again. Then they get hardened. They harden their heart. And now they're going to go out and attack it. And now they speak evil of it to the multitude. And they're saying, you know, this is just wrong. And that's why you have the wicked God-haters. And it's so common you see these reprobates, you see these guys, the faggots, the homos that are out in this world, and, and it's uncanny how many times you run into people that are, that are just full-blown sodomites somewhere in their life, like you'll see a lot of times it's a, it's a pastor's son or a pastor's daughter or people who had, you know, you know pastors or, or people who are really, really into the church and especially the, the right churches and Baptist churches, and stuff. you'll see these people... They just go completely the opposite direction. And they hate God. They don't want to have anything to do with it. They speak evil of it. They get into all, they're, they're just living an extremely wicked lifestyle because they rejected it. And oftentimes you'll see that the people who have heard it the most end up being the worst wicked individuals that you'll find because they harden themselves to it and just completely rejected it and just, and just want nothing to do with it at all. And that's where, where you see these reprobate people. I believe that they had many opportunities to get saved. And people were trying, loving them, and trying to get them saved, and trying to show them the gospel, but they just rejected it. Mm -hmm. And um, Which is a whole different type of person than these other guys that we saw that weren't saved earlier in the chapter, where you know they thought they were saved, but they didn't quite get it. Right? They just needed someone to explain it a little bit better to them, a little bit more. These other people, they've had it explained and they understood. And there's a lot of people I've talked to where they understand the gospel. And you say, you could, you could ask them the questions and they'll, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. But they reject it. They don't believe it. They don't want to accept it. They don't want to put their faith in Christ. And this, that's the point where people get hardened. And we need to, to use this because what happens here, Paul says he departed from them. Right? There's no point in continuing to talk to people once they've been hardened, once they've decided, you know what, no. And this is good advice, just going out sowing. You're talking to someone at the door, right? You're, you're witnessing someone, you're, you're giving them the gospel. When people are just really hard to, to, to what you're saying and, and just want to argue and dispute and debate and, not, and just not listening, you know, not doing any type of receiving of what you're saying and thinking about it and, you know, responding. It doesn't mean that everyone always has to agree with you, right? That's not what I'm talking about. You, you know, we have discussions with people a lot of times, but it has to be a discussion where they're listening to what you have to say. You can listen to what they have, they have to say. But when you can see that they're hardened and they either want to teach you or just tell you why you're wrong and just say that that's, you know, the Bible's not true. What you do is we follow Titus chapter 3. I try to follow this as closely as possible. Titus 3, 9 says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Titus 3, verse 9. He's saying, Avoid the foolish questions. People come at you with all these stupid questions, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law, he says, those are unprofitable and vain. Verse 10, it says, A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted 
and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So what you do is you give someone, you know, someone's a heretic. A heretic is someone who's just espousing this, this false doctrine and just trying to show you and teach you, and no, 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 this, you know, and they're coming at you with a false gospel or false doctrine. They're a heretic. He says, okay, you give them one admonition. You say, no, no, look, look, look at right here. Look at, look at this chapter and verse. Look at Acts 19.4. See, it says that, um, you know, John barely baptized the baptism of repentance, saying that people should say, believe, you know, believe on him. See that? And then you show someone, say, no, 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 no. See, no, you still have to turn from your sins. No, I, I don't believe it. You have to turn from your sins. So you say, okay, I'll give you another one. You give him a second admonition. Okay, how, about, how about this verse, right? And you show them these verses. But if they're hardened, and if they're, if they're a heretic, and you, you know, they're not receiving what you're saying, reject them. Be done with it. Walk on. Move on to the next place. Depart from it. And this is what we see that, that Paul did, and that's what we can find in Titus chapter 3. It's this, this concept of you don't need to, to continually just talk. I mean, and maybe it's someone that you love. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a family member. Um, but don't waste your time too much on, on these people that are just hardened and they're, and they're rejecting it. Move on to someone that will accept it because this, happen, this happens all the time out somewhere. You'll get someone that'll want to debate you and argue with you and fight with you. And in the flesh, you can get caught up into that and say, oh, well, I know more Bible than this guy. I'm going to show him. Right? And you, and you can think in your mind, man, I'm just, I'm destroying this guy. I, I'm running circles around him. And you're wasting all this time with someone who's not listening, doesn't care what you have to say. They have, they're hardened their heart already. They're, they don't, they're not accepting and believing anything that you're saying, regardless of the fact that, that you're showing them the truth and that, and that you're, you're destroying their arguments, right? If you can see that that person just, nothing's getting through to them, you're wasting your time. Because a few doors down the road, if you didn't spend an hour with this guy, this other guy that was home for 30 minutes and ended up leaving, him you might have been able to get saved because he would have been open to hearing and accepting and receiving what you had to say. So you give everyone the opportunity here. I mean, you say the first and second admonition. You know, you try to show them. And, and lovingly and meekly and humbly try to show them. You know, not with some attitude. Just try to show them, well, look, you know, let me, have you seen this verse? What about this? Have you shown them a couple times? Okay, if they're still a heretic, if they're still just not receiving what you're saying, move on. Move on to the next one. This is, this is advice that we can take in our personal dealings with people, especially giving the gospel out, which is exactly what Paul is doing here in this story in, in uh, verses 8 and 9. Now, it also says there at the end of verse 9, then, when he's done in the synagogues, and they've hardened, it says, um, he separated the disciples right at the end of verse 9, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Now, Remember that Paul was dis he was disputing in the synagogues, and now he's disputing in the school of Tyrannus. Now, were these synagogues, were they full of saved people? Because I don't believe they were. I think they were following the Jews' religion, the, the, the Judaism religion. That's why he even went there was to do soul winning, was to get people saved out of the synagogues. Now, neither is this school. Okay, The school that we see here in Acts 19, this is not full of saved people either because he's disputing with them as well. He's arguing with them. So this isn't a very positive attribute for a mention of a school in the Bible. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because this is the only place in the Bible that the word school exists. Okay, There's only one other reference in the Bible that would be anything similar to school, and that's college. The word college is found twice in the Bible in the Old Testament, but the reason it's found twice is because it's the same exact story. In 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, referring to the same exact event. So essentially, it's one other time. And in 2 Kings 22, verse 14, the Bible says, So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Akbor, and Shaphan, and Azahiah, went unto Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Haraz, Haraz, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. Those are the two mentions of anything that would be associated with a school or a college. That's it. So Paul's disputing with people in this school of Tyrannus. And you have a prophetess, right, in 2 Kings that dwelt in Jerusalem in a college. Neither one of those bodes very well for, for 
how the Bible is, is referring to schools and colleges. Um, and the reason why I'm even bringing this up is because a lot of people these days think, they'll ask me too. Like, and I've had people ask me, oh, you're a pastor? Where did you go to Bible college? Oh. Right? Where did you go to school? Where did you get your schooling? Where did you go to Bible college? And I say, I didn't go to Bible college. Bible college isn't in the Bible. Okay? And that's not the way they did it. That's not the way they trained or taught for it. This is a... Uh, this idea of school is a concept that comes from the world. This is never de designed in God's work. You never see God saying, okay, you're going to have a church, and then the church is going to create a school, and then the school is where the, all the kids come together, and they, they gather together in one place, and there's one teacher, and they all teach the kids, and then um, when you get older, then you're going to do the same thing, and that's where you're going to learn the Bible from. Never found in the Bible one time. In fact, the Bible says that the parents are responsible for raising their children. The parents are the ones that are supposed to teach their children and to raise them and to bring them up. That's why we homeschool our children. That's why we're not going to send them down to the public indoctrination center where the state can tell them what to believe and what's right and what's wrong. They're going to get that teaching from their parents at home. We're going to teach them. We're going to educate them. The Bible never says to go drop your kid off somewhere for eight hours out of the day and let someone else take care of them, and let someone else watch them, and let someone else teach them the truths that they need to know that are going to be important for their day-to-day -day life as they get older. The Bible never talks about that, and the Bible never says that a pastor needs to be a graduate of a Bible college in order to pastor a church. Those are not one of the requirements that are found in the Bible. The Bible says that he needs to be the husband of one wife, one that ruleth his own household well, that keeps his children in subjection, one that's not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, right? These are attributes of a pastor, not a novice, okay? So does that mean that, that, that the pastor that I'm not learned in the Bible, does that mean that I haven't studied, that I haven't done my work and my homework, so to speak, in the Bible? No, of course not. That's not what that means. It just means I didn't go to some institution that's not found in the Bible, to get myself some com letter of commendation that's written by some man saying, you're a master of divinity, right? When the Bible says, it's called no man on earth your master, for there's one. And that's, that's God the Father. There, you know, I'm not going to get some title before my name. I don't need to be Dr. David Burzid or, or master of theology. I don't need any of that stuff. Now look, did I go to school? Yes, I did. I didn't go to I didn't go to, to cemetery or seminary. I didn't do any of that stuff. I went to, to you know Arizona State University and got a degree there. But even still, that was before I even really understood or knew much about homeschooling and, and his other education. I mean the brainwashing goes so deep it's just kind of ingrained in us, well this is what you do. You go to public school, from there you go to college, from there you get a job, and this is just the way that society is trained these days. But it hasn't always been that way, and I don't believe that that's the right way to do it. I think you can gain an education, a much better education, for a lot less money by reading books or by, by learning on the job or learning from people who, who have the skills and just learning one-on-one -on -one with them instead of sitting in a classroom with you know, 50 or 100 other people and just having someone lecture you. Now look, can you learn that way? Sure you can. But... I, and, you know, I don't want to get off on this whole tirade of, of public schools and why we shouldn't have them and, and everything else because I'm just going to try to stick to Acts 19 and there's so much more I need to cover in this chapter. But anyways, I bring it up because this is the only place that the word school is in the Bible. This is it. So if I'm not preaching on Acts 19, then it's going to be a long time before we get back to this again unless I'm doing a sermon specific to this topic. But um, those are the only places it's mentioned. You know, don't fall into this, oh, well, you need to go to Bible college if you're going to be a pastor and all this other stuff. It's nonsense. You, you can't be a novice. You need to meet the, all the requirements. God takes the position seriously, but you don't need some degree from, from some institutional institution that's never found in the Bible. Um, so let's move on from that. Let's continue here in verse number 10. It says, and this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And um, I love that verse. It says, all they, everybody, all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Paul made sure everybody heard the gospel. And this was the other thing that he was going to have. When he would say that, you know, 
Um, my hands are clean. You know, I'm clean as people we saw last week in chapter 18. Because Paul made sure that everybody heard the gospel. And that's our goal in this church, is to make sure that everybody in Prescott Valley hears the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our mission, is to make sure that everybody that dwells here hears the word of the Lord Jesus. And uh, continue out here, verse 11, it says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of, of excuse me, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. Now, there's this movement of these charismatic faith healers that got a lot of popularity in the 80s and 90s. That's where it really kind of blew up. And you have these televangelists like the Benny Hens, right? These people who got really famous and they preach this prosperity gospel and they're nothing but, but false prophets that teach lies for filthy lucre's sake. But they do these things and you'll see, um, I can't even remember who it was. I didn't know at the time. When I was younger, I saw this on TV. They would have on the, you know, on the religion channel, whatever it is, the TBN or whatever it was, they'd have these guys that are saying, you can get this, your handkerchief, and it's the, the healing handkerchief, and just send in 1995, and here's the phone number, and place your order, and we'll send out this handkerchief to you, and, and it'll heal you. It's got these special properties. It's been prayed over and anointed, and people will use this, they use this scripture in Acts 19 to, to fool people. And there's a lot of people out there that are deceived. I mean, these guys, Benny Hinn has millions of followers. I mean, these people, he goes, he fills up the stadiums. He's, a, he's like a multi-billionaire or millionaire um, from all the money he gets from these people that are donating to him. And he's got a lot of people following him because he's got people hoodwinked. And here's the thing, a lot of people, they want to believe in miracles. I mean, that's why there's so, there's so many people that are superstitious they go to psychics, they go to all these other people because they want to believe that there's something else and they want to believe in miracles. And see, the thing is, miracles are true. Of course they are. But they get sucked in by these charlatans. And it's important to notice here in, in Acts 19.11, it says, God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. So were all the other apostles or disciples doing these miracles that Paul were... were um, the handkerchiefs or aprons were healing people that had diseases? No. They were special to Paul. God gave him these special miracles that he can do. It's not something that, that everybody had. This was something that was special miracles by the hands of Paul. And there is no evidence that is by the hands of anybody else where you could have something where a handkerchief or an apron were brought to people that had diseases where the diseases would depart from them and the evil spirits went out of them. But this was an amazing thing for Paul. I mean, this is this was a great miracle. But the 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 extortioners out there today, the the, the false prophets that that preach for money and they preach for they just preach a bunch of lies, trying to get people sucked in. They'll tell you, oh, well, send us some money and we'll send you a handkerchief. And they're just deceiving people and sucking them in. Look at um, verse thirteen. I'm running out of time here. This chapter is packed. We're only on verse 13. It says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. So, well, let's keep reading. I'll read the whole story and then we'll go through it. Verse 14, And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So here, in the story, what we have here, you have these vagabond Jews, right? So these are some Jews. Now, they weren't saved. These were just this vagabond Jews. They roam around, and what they did was, it says they were exorcists. So what they did, they would, they would try to go and, and cast devils out of people, right? That was their job. That was what they were doing. And um, I can't, you read this story, I can't help but think of those, um, those movies like The Exorcist yeah. and stuff like that where you've got these Catholic priests going in and doing all their rituals and, and trying to get rid, exorcise these demons out of people, right? And, and they're going through and they've got the holy water and they're chanting a prayer and they got their rosaries and all their other good luck charms. And um, 
It's kind of funny because the outcome is about the same in, in, the, in that story, that movie, as it is here. Right? The, the, right here, the devil just, just one guy. There were seven of these guys that were Jews. These seven of these vagabond Jews, they were all brothers, right? They were sons of one Siva, the chief priest. They were going out, and they, they come across this guy. He's got a devil. He's possessed, right? They try to cast out this devil, but see, they try something different this time. They knew that, the, that Paul was out there and his disciples, they were out casting out devils. By the power of God, they were casting devils out. So they kind of catch wind, you know, because they were saying by, the, by the, you know, the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to depart from out of him. And that, that's what some of the things that, that Peter was saying, that Paul was saying when they were literally casting devils out of people. So they hear about this and they say, oh, okay, well, this is working for him. We're going to try the same thing. Right? We're, we're going we're to see if that works for us. So they go in and he says, um, it says, they took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. You know, this isn't Jesus who they preach. They're not believers in Christ. They're not saved. They don't have the power of God on them. They're saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. The, the guy, that, that guy preaches them, and that's the name we're going to use, so get out. All right. All right, let's try it again. Paul preach about Jesus. Get out, devils. And what happens to him? Well, it says the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> who are you, clowns? Who do you think you are? I know who Jesus is. I know who Paul is. But who are you? It says the man in whom the spirit was leaped on them. And overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. He beat them up, ripped their clothes off of one guy. And there were seven of these guys. And just just tr evil treated them and, and beat them up. And they, they fled out of their naked and wounded. They didn't have the power of God. Now think about this too, because that devil said, Jesus I know and Paul I know. Now of course they know Jesus. We get that from the scripture. But he says, Paul I know. Are you the type of Christian that's making the types of waves where the devils are going to know who you are? Because I guarantee you, they did not like Paul at all. They didn't like Jesus. They were scared of Jesus. They should have been scared of Paul too because Paul had the power of God to cast them out. Paul made waves and the, and the devils knew who Paul was. Paul was doing great work for God. And see, here's the thing. Paul also got attacked a lot. The more good things you do for God, and we mentioned this before, the more you're going to get attacked. The more great things you do, the great works, the more people you're getting saved, the more you've got God's power on you and in your life, you've got the Holy Ghost resting on you, and you're doing great works for God, the devils are going to know about you. The devils are going to find out, and the attacks are going to come, but you've got to be ready for them. But, but how great is that just to say, like, hey, I'm known, you know, if you're doing that good of work to be known by the devils, you're doing the right thing. You're definitely making an impact. And Paul made a big impact. See, but see, the devils don't know who these guys were. They weren't even saved. I mean, you could say they were children of the devil. They didn't even know who they were. They're just like, you guys, you're not doing anything. We're not worried about you. They're not even going to go and attack those guys, except that they were clowning around trying to get them out of this other guy that, that he was possessed with. And, and um, they're just like, yeah, just get out of here. You know, scram. We don't want anything to do with you. And they even treated him. But um, it's just, it's so, it's so ironic how they have these movies where it's like The Exorcist and it lines up exactly with what this is. And they weren't even trying to do that. And um, they always show the Catholic priest. And the Catholics, the, I mean, they're not saved. They're, um, they're basically just like these vagabond Jews. Using their rituals, doing these same things, getting their holy water, trying to, without, without the true power of God. And the only way that anyone's ever going to cast out devils is not going to be by these, by these rituals. You're going to need the power of God in order to make them depart. And, uh, but let's continue on here. In verse number 17, it says, And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Verse 19, Many of them also which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. 
So this is a great revival going on. There's a lot of people being reached with the gospel and, and truly repenting and turning to God and believing completely in Christ. And when they realize, hey, you know, this is the truth and the Bible is the word of God and they see the scripture. And then obviously they understand that witchcraft is wrong and that, and that all these things are wrong. So they take their, their, um, their books. That's what the curious arts Curious arts is like witchcraft, essentially. It's um, it's it's what they were into apparently, and they had all these books on witchcraft. So they just came, they took them and burned them. And these days, it makes up people go, don't burn books. <laughs> they were wicked. They should be burned. All the wicked books should be burned. That's why I'll take I'll take those the false perversions of the Bible and burn those. Those aren't God's word. They twisted it. They ought to be burned, just like all these other witchcraft books and the, you know, the satanic Bible and all that stuff. It's worthless, it's wickedness, and it ought to be burned. But I like that attitude. And there's a lot of people that, that, that you reach a point, especially usually early on after you get saved. Um, hopefully this happens, at least. I don't know. Where um, when you start getting on fire for God, whatever point that may be, I remember in my life when... Um, when I just decided, you know what, I want to live for God. When you make that, when you come to that decision, when you say, you know what, this is, I want to get rid of as much sin as possible in my life. I did something similar to this. I took my, um, when, I, when I finally understood and came to realization and was willing to just, to just say, you know what, I'm going to get rid of this stuff. I had a large worldly music collection of all the rock and roll, the God haters, I mean, the, the worst of the worst. I mean, the this garbage of people who literally worship Satan and I had their music and I was pumping it into my head and I enjoyed it and I listened to it and it tickled my soul and I thought it was great. I love music. I still love music, but that music got to me and that music had a very, very negative impact on my life and it had a negative impact on everyone's life from these devil worshipers and these people that, that are promoting all kinds of wickedness and filth and sin. It's going to get into your head and they use the sound of the music to, to entice you to not pay as much attention to what they're saying. And they use that as the instrument to get into your head and, and to get their thoughts into your head. And, um, and I, I, I came to that realization and was, and was willing to say, you know what, God, I'm going to get rid of this, even though my flesh likes it, even though it actually feels good for me to listen to this music. So I'm going to get rid of it because I know that they're not honoring you or glorifying you in any way. And that actually the stuff that they're saying, the stuff that they're promoting, the stuff that I'm listening to is completely against you and against what you'd have me to do. So I want it out of my life. So I took my whole collection. Now, it was worth a lot of money. I had a lot of rare stuff and these CDs and stuff and bootlegs and all these other things, right? I could have said, well, I'm just going to sell it. Then I won't have it anymore. And I'll have all this money that, you know, I, I invested all this money. So no. When you see something's wicked, nobody should have that. And that's why I said, you know, I had a roommate, and I said, he would have loved to have that stuff. And he was a friend of mine. Well, what kind of friend would I be if I say, well, this is wicked and garbage, and it's only going to destroy my life if I have it, but here, you have it, because you're my friend. Huh. No, you can't do that. When you, when you see something that's just wicked like that, you just need to destroy it, burn it, get rid of it. I took a hammer and a chisel, and I smashed through that, because I was throwing it away, but I want to make sure nobody can get it. If someone finds it in a the dumpster, they're not going to get it. They're not going to use it. I obliterated it. I, took, I did the same thing with my DVD collection. And all kinds of movies, all these Hollywood just, just promoting filth and adultery and fornication and, and wickedness. And it's just it's garbage. And nobody should be looking at this stuff. It's not good. And I destroyed it all. And again, I mean, look, this isn't to say like, oh, I'm some great Christian. No. When you get right with God like these people did, it's something you need to do. You just need to purge this stuff out. Get rid of it. And ultimately, it doesn't matter. I mean, think about it like, so I go the rest of my life without listening to that worldly music. So what? What's the big deal? I mean, people look at it like, oh, how could you do that? It's a big It's not a big deal. Um, it's a big deal to God, I think, to continue doing that, especially when you see it's a sin and we shouldn't be doing that stuff. But, you know, when you finally just get it out of your life, I mean, we, we talk about this from time to time. You know, my wife and I both used to watch TV regularly, frequently, just, just watching all these different shows and stuff. And ever since we decided, you know, 
We're not going to watch TV, right? We're watch that filthy program. We're not going to allow ourselves to be programmed by the media, by, the, by, the, um, by Hollywood, by any of this stuff. We got rid of it. Now it's like, when would we even do it? You know what I mean? Like, like there's other things to fill those voids and much better things. I mean, when you start reading the Bible and going so and doing all that stuff, hey, when do you even have time to, sit to, to, to be filled with the world's garbage and be filled with their crap? So um, anyways, it's a good thing to do, especially from time to time, to refresh yourself and just say, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to take an inventory of the stuff in my house. Whatever I think isn't pleasing to God, I'm going to get rid of it and just, and just purge it, destroy it, get it out. And that's, you know, that's kind of a, it's, it's good to have that kind of a, a break too, like a, like a clean break. When I got rid of my music, when I just, when I actually just, just physically destroyed it, in my mind even, it's just, it's just, that's a separation where it's like, I'm not going back to that. I could have kept the stuff in a box in case I wanted to use it later. But then it's like, you didn't, you don't really make that break. By, by just saying, you know what? This is wicked. I'm going to destroy it. You kind of help make that extra break, that extra separation from that sin to not be as likely to go back to it. Um, and that's something that these people did. And said they counted the price of them. They found it 50,000 pieces of silver. That's really expensive. So they didn't go out and sell it. They burned it. They said, look, this is, this is worth a lot. 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money. I don't know exactly what the conversion rate is back then, but I know a piece of silver these days is going about $20. Assuming it's about the same size, fifty thousand times twenty, you do the math. I mean, that's that's a lot of money. It's a million bucks. So um, they burned it. They didn't care. They wanted to be right with God. But let's uh, let's continue here. Look at verse. Let's jump down. I'm gonna skip ahead because I'm really running out of time. Verse number twenty-four. It says, "For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen." whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this crap we have our wealth. So now we're jumping into an aspect of the story here where, um, you know, Paul's preaching and he's making a huge impact. It says there's no small stir about that way. It means there's this great stir. He's making, he's causing a lot of commotion. He's doing a lot of good. I mean, to the point where all these people are bringing their books and they're burning them. And there, there's so many people turning to God, right? And this is an Ephesus. Okay, so these people... In times past, they were they believed in false in a false religion, a false god. They had their idols. This guy made altars for or shrines for the. He made silver shrines for Diana. Diana was their goddess. That was the main goddess of Ephesus, whom they worshipped. Right. That was their state religion. That's who they who they believed in. He's making such an impact here. People are turning to God. They're forsaking that stuff. So these guys are like, wait a minute. You know, we're making, this is our livelihood. We're, you know, we're earning money off of the fact that people worship, you know, um, Diana. And they need all these trinkets and these, these um, shrines and, and these idols and all this stuff that they do that they sell unto them. Because that was part of their false religion. Now it's like they don't need this stuff anymore. The, the demand is going down as people are turning to God. So they've got this, this abundance of supply, and they're saying, hey, we're not going to make any money of this. We don't like this. We're going to stop it. And so that's where now this persecution comes from. And it's happened before in the book of Acts 2 where, where people, they don't like the fact that their pocketbook's being affected. They don't care what the truth is at all. I mean, if they cared what the truth is, they'd say, glory to God, you know, let's get rid of this junk. They don't care, but that's, and that's because the love of money is the root of all evil. These people just care about the dollar. They just care about their bottom line. They don't care about, they're not interested in hearing the truth. They're even caught up probably in their false religion. They're probably worshipers of Diana as well. And they're making all this stuff. And I mean, I think about this in today's society. Can you imagine if there was a great revival in an area that was predominantly Roman Catholic? You got an area of people where they're, it's, it's the majority of people that are all Roman Catholic. And... Think about all the little trinkets and things that they get. They get the statues of Mary and the saints and the rosaries and, and all of these, these trinkets and, and idols and, and everything else. If, well, if they turn to God, they're not going to be messing with that stuff anymore. 
and and you imagine the you know the Christian bookstore that's saying we're going to be going out of business soon because no one's buying our rosaries, no one's buying all this all this this nonsense, and um, that I guarantee you that would bring persecution against God's people, against the people who are behind turning people unto God and turning them away from that from that false religion, that false worship. But um, there's one last point I want to bring up because I'm, I'm completely out of time. Jump down, if you would, to verse number 34. Because basically what happens here is they say, okay, these guys get everybody upset, the silversmiths and stuff. So they're like, hey, look, we're going we're gonna to lose a lot of money because people are turning to God and they don't, you know, they're not going to want our stuff anymore. So they, they, um, they go after Paul. And they, they didn't get him, but they get, um, I think, Gaius and Aristarchus, and they bring them into the theater. So they grab them, get them in the theater. There's this big uproar. And it says that the more part didn't even know why they were there. So like, there's all this confusion. They've got the whole city gathered together, and people are just kind of like, you know, just mad and angry and upset. And most of the people don't even know why they're angry and upset. There's just like, you know, there's these guys here. And um, it says... Uh, Verse 29, I'll start reading from there. And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, and Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. The reason they were coming together is because these silversmiths were upset about, about them teaching against Diana and them losing their money. But there's this big uproar, there's all this confusion, and people don't even know why they're there and, and what's going on. Verse 33 says, And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. So he's saying, okay, okay, he's like, hold on, let me talk here. You know, Everybody's crying out, they're upset. He said, let me speak. Verse 34 says, But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So this guy is going to talk, right? And they can't even let him speak. For two hours, they just also go, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And just, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they just won't let this guy talk. This is their pea brain mentality. They're just going to, we're just going to shut you down, we're not going to let you talk, and we're just going to chant this stupid saying over and over and over again for hours so that you can't speak. And this, if you know anything about politics, if you follow any of this stuff at all, this happens all the time. It, this scenario completely reminded me, how about this? Does anyone remember this? Yes, we can! Yes, we can! Yes, we can! And if you don't follow politics as much as I do then good for you. <laughs> if you remember what that chant is from, that's all the, the Obama zombies that were out there. When, and, and you see this at, you know, at the, if you get somebody who, who kind of you know, appreciates freedom or appreciates liberty or maybe has a little bit of respect for how the country was founded and, and things like that, <clears throat> and something like that tries to make a point or would try to say, you know, make a rational just just try to make a point or make a statement. Anytime that, that the opposition would hear that, they just start going on these chants. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And just try to drown out the person who's just bringing logic and just trying to bring facts and trying to bring his case up to the people. This happens all the time. You get the, the, the dumbed down zombies. They don't want to hear what you have to say. They don't care. Okay? They'll just chant over and over again just to drown you out. And that's exactly what they did to Stephen. To remember earlier in the book of Acts, when, when Stephen was martyred, the Bible says that they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit of Stephen. They couldn't resist his wisdom. He had the spirit of God. He was speaking things that they could not speak against. There was no way they could, they could argue with it. So what did they do? They stopped their ears, and they ran on him, and they killed him. And that's exactly the way these people are behaving. They behave like little children. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Great is the head of the Ephesians. Great. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Because they don't want to hear the truth. 
They'd rather listen and believe in their fairy tale and their lies that's going to somehow get them something than they, than they are interested in the truth. And this is a church, hopefully you understand, this is a church where you're going to hear the truth. Okay? And it might come at a cost. It might come at, um, you know, you might have to give some things up. Or, I mean, you don't have to to be part of this church, but you might, you know, you might be convicted to give up some things and give up some sins. It might cost you something. But if you're interested in hearing the truth, we have God's word. And we're going to preach this word, whether people like it or not. And, uh, and hopefully you won't be stopping your ears at it, but you'll be, able, you'll be listening. And um, unlike these, these heathens and, and the people who just, just want to keep believing in their lives. So basically what happened here, just, just finishing up the story. Um, you know, they're in this theater and they're, they're chanting and chanting and then basically just the, the assembly gets dismissed. He's saying, look, if you have something against these guys, the deputies are here. If, there's, if, they, if they broke the law and if you have a complaint against them, the law the law's open, we'll hear your complaint. But if not, if it's about other things like your religion, then, you know, this isn't a lawful assembly. We're going to be called in a question for this day's uproar, is what he said. You know, we just got to quit this thing right now because it turned into a mob. That's what it was. It was just a big mob. It was a big witch hunt. And, um, and he, you know, the guy dismisses the assembly, and, and that's where the story ends. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this, for this chapter. God, there's so many great truths in the Bible here, especially packed into this chapter. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to go home and study the Bible more. And help us to know your word and to know the truth and, um, and to love the truth and not to stop our ears when we hear it and not to be stiff-necked, dear Lord, and not to resist it, but just to accept it for what it is. And, um, and I thank you for it. God, I pray that you please just be with us all as we go our separate ways this evening. Keep us safe. Keep us protected from evil and from the wiles of the devil, dear Lord. Strengthen us in our faith and help us continue to grow in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.